So good morning, everyone. Today we're going to start looking at power series. And we've looked at these a little bit. The notation will move around a little bit, but the summation notation is pretty standard. Um, what you're seeing here is the big sigma, the S in Greek, capital S, standing for a sum of things. And that's the way we want to write these as much as we can because of the nice condensed notation. And so, yeah, you'll see a lot of this in math, and so you want to become comfortable with it. This means add up a bunch of these individual terms. So there's a C0, you start at 0, C0, x to the 0, so that's just C0, plus C1, x to the first, so that's C1x, and then C2, x squared. And so what this what this expands out to is C0 plus C1x plus C sub 2x squared plus C sub 3x cubed all the way through. Now, there's two forms on these power series we're going to use. The first one, we just see x by itself, and we call that centered at 0. You can think of this as x minus 0. There are some of these series that we want to shift over a little bit. And those are especially the series that are undefined at zero, like log x. We're going to have a power series for log x, but we can't start it at zero because when we plug in zero, you know, it's going to be all kinds of problems. And so we'll normally want to move that over to one. And so we'll shift it like x minus one, or more generally as x minus a. And so you'll see powers instead of powers of x, you'll see powers of x minus one x plus 3, or x minus 5, some x minus a taken up. And that's called a Taylor series. Now you notice if a is 0, then the Taylor series is a Maclaurin series. So every Maclaurin series is a Taylor series, but only some Taylor series are also Maclaurin series. For full generalization, I'll be talking about Taylor series. But a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you is just based on the Florin series, but it goes on. You can use it, use all the information as if replacing X with X minus A doesn't make any difference in most of the presentation here. It just makes it a little bit more difficult for you to read, so I'm going to stick with the McLaurin series notation every time I can, because you guys like McLaurin series better. I know that. Now, these are series, right? They're going to converge or diverge. And here now, they're going to converge or diverge depending upon the value of x. Okay? That's the big thing here. And so we're generally going to be talking about radius of convergence. Some radius of convergence when we're looking to pay attention to these, okay? So let me get this centered again and continue. Here we go. So the radius of convergence will signify with a big capital letter R. Okay? And I'm showing this now for a, a generic Taylor series where I'm moving over by A. Okay? And that's just the center of, when we say centered at, that's the center of the interval of convergence that has a particular radius. Now, here's an interesting thing. What happens if I plug in A into this sequence? What is X minus A when X is equal to A? Can people tell me in the chat? What is X minus A equal to when X is equal to A? Yeah, that's right, Lourdes. That's right, Timothy. Thank you, Ryan. And I'm, I am mean, this is one of my greatest concerns about this environment is that I'm not going to be able to see you guys. So I can't see the student who is confused in the back now. Yeah. And also, I can't see when somebody looks uncomfortable with my arithmetic because I made arithmetic here. So I'm going to need you guys to speak up right here. So Lourdes and Timothy and Ryan, thank you so much for answering that question. What about the rest of you guys? Are you getting this? 
what is this equal to when, what is x minus a equal to when x equals a? Everybody, please. Thank you. Thank you. That makes me feel much better. Thank you, Kayleen and Osmodo and Patrick. Okay. But see, that's like, that's like six of you guys. And thank you, Anthony. That's seven of you guys. I got 10 of you in here. Do I have three students who aren't getting it? I don't know unless you tell me. And I have to check this. I can't do a visual check of your faces. And thank you, Kevin. That's eight. I've got two more. I'm missing two. David, what is X? Yeah, thank you. Okay, guys. And that's nine. <laughs> Who am I missing? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's everybody. That's everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. And, yeah, so really, guys, don't worry. If some... No, there's no point turning on the webcams right now, Ryan, because you're, nobody can see cams while I'm sharing, apparently. You Can you see my cam? Can you see my cam now? Because it's running. Yeah, that's just it. If I stopped sharing, if I stopped sharing, okay, yeah, if I stop sharing, as soon as I stop sharing, cam comes back up. See? And now when I go back to sharing, yeah, my cam goes away. My cam goes away, your cam goes away too. Okay, that's how that works. Okay. Yeah, I really wish I could see everybody, but that's it. Are there are other environments that that works better with. I'm, I don't know. I haven't checked it right there, but they're not as natural and they're not native to Blackboard, so they don't automatically leave me with recording where you can see it. So there's that, right? Okay. Any case, so the first thing you notice from this last question here, right? is that if x is equal to a, we're going to have a, a series of a bunch of constants times zero. That's kind of trivial, huh? So the whole sum is just equal to zero. So in particular, every power series converges at a, or at zero if I'm just using the Maclaurin form. This is the Taylor form, so I can say that it converges at a. Now, that's a kind of trivial interval for convergence. And so we talk about that. And we talk about the radius there. If we're only talking about convergence at that point A, or zero, if we're looking from the Clorin side, then I say the radius is zero. Okay? And if I'm looking at the actual interval of convergence, that's just at A. It's trivial. Okay? So let's look at real things. The actual things we're going to look for are a finite interval or an infinite interval. The finite interval is when the absolute value, the distance from A, is less than some value K. And if it converges inside here and diverges outside of here, then we say the radius is K. Now understand that it needs both of those things to be true has to converge inside this radius and diverge outside this radius. Now, some people might say, but what, 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 I mean, why does this side have to be equal to that side? And that's just a characteristic. That is a characteristic of these power series. If you center a particular A by writing X minus A, powers of X minus A, the area where it converges is always going to be this equidistant area from one side to the other. It's the radius. Outside that radius, it's going to diverge. Inside that radius, it will converge. And if it's a finite interval, you actually have to check the endpoints separately to figure out what the interval of convergence is. Now, if it converges for all values of x, and that happens a lot, that happens for the sine function as a power series, and the cosine function, the exponential functions. The radius convergence is normally either zero or some finite number or infinite. 
a is a value where of x, okay? The radius is the distance from a where the function still is converging, okay? The radius is never a. A is something we're reserving for how far we have shifted the function, okay? So there we are. So we'll say the radius is zero, that's trivial. It's not an especially interesting function, it's the zero function. Or the radius is some finite value, and that's gonna happen quite a bit, like for geometric series. And there are other ones like the exponentials and the sines and cosines that can have infinite intervals of convergence. So, in general, what we'll be looking at here is the interval of convergence is going to include this open region between a minus k and a plus k. And then we're going to add in any endpoints that converge. Now, here's the fun thing. You heard me say geometric. Geometric, almost always, when we're doing checking for convergence in here, we're going to use the ratio tests on these power tiers. That's why I told you in the last lecture that the ratio test was most important. Now, at the endpoints, usually the nth term test will tell you everything you need to know. Okay? Sometimes you'll have one side and not the other side. And what will happen in those cases is you'll check an nth term test on one side and it'll converge on the other side. Well, maybe it will, it will converge, maybe it won't. But generally, one of those sides, one of those endpoints is going to be alternating. And that's why also the alternating series test is also the second most important of the convergence tests that we talked about. We'll be using the ratio tests almost exclusively for figuring out the radius of convergences. And then for the endpoints, we'll have to use other tests. One of those tests will almost certainly be the alternating series test to figure out the other endpoint. Okay? So let's take a look again. What are the key concepts on this page? If a power series entered at zero, that means x minus a, where a is zero, we call them a Clorin series. If it's centered at some value a on the number line, some x value a, then we call it a Taylor series. Every Maclaurin series is a Taylor series. And so I could just talk about these as Taylor series. They all converge within some radius of convergence. Sometimes, occasionally, you're stuck with a nasty one, and it only converges just at one value, a. In which case, well, the radius is zero. Then we have areas where it converges across a finite region, and then we have areas where it converges across an infinite region. All right? So there's the basics. I need to cover a little bit more theory, okay? So let me get myself set up right there. I want to talk about what it means for a power series to represent a function. Now, in particular, sometimes a power series converges, and sometimes a power series doesn't converge. And sometimes if a function which is representable by a power series but that power series only applies inside a convergence radio, but the function itself applies outside. Okay? You know, there are some functions out there that actually have values all over the place. Like 1 over 1 minus x. 1 over 1 minus x has values all over the place. 1 over 1 minus x, particularly. Why isn't this? showing up. Oh, it, wow, that was a long delay. That was almost five seconds. From the time I punched it. Okay, so I want you to recognize this power series, because this is a canonical power series. One, you'll see again and again in the example, because it's so nice and easy to work with. This is one plus x plus x plus one all else, right? And we should recognize this. We should recognize this power series is what happened when we expanded just using long division. 
we expanded this expression 1 over 1 minus x. Remember that one? Now, here's the thing. That power series, 1 plus x plus x squared, that only converges when add x is less than 1. But you know the function 1 over 1 minus x has values for every x except for 1. Okay? Yeah. So we say it converts the function inside its interval of convergence. Now, the real joy on working with these power series is because we're looking at something that looks a whole lot like a polynomial. These are like in polynomials. We know how easy it is to deal with polynomials and calculus, right? You can integrate them real easy. You can differentiate them really easy. And so, yeah, whenever possible, we want to work with power series. And that's the thing. Okay, so let's take a look at this canonical example, which is actually, uh, this is a geometric series, guys. X is a half, is one plus a half plus a half squared plus whatever, okay? And if X is uh, two thirds, it plus two thirds, plus two thirds squared, plus two thirds cubed, okay? And that's what we're looking at here. And now, the usual case, you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna check there's David R was in for a moment and then leave. But I think that's the only person I was missing. Oh, sorry. Now, the thing is, in this one, I want you to look at the ratio test. Okay? What is the nth term? What is the nth term on some x to the n? It's just x to the n, right? Yeah. And. The next term is x to the n plus 1. So when you're looking at the ratio term, it's always the next term over the term, over each term. So we're looking at the next term for the ratio test here. x to the n plus 1. And the previous term was x to the n. And the ratio of those next divided by previous x to the n plus x, x to the n, the absolute value is just x. And the ratio test tells me this will converge when that ratio is less than 1. It will diverge when the ratio is greater than 1. And so immediately, we get the radius of convergence on this is equal to 1. Now, we have, don't have the full interval my audio is blipping in and out. Yeah, that, uh, that the word is chopping. <laughs> and that's exactly what I wanted you to let me know about. I think that's less of an issue if I speak more slowly and I pause. Because if it's network congestion, the issue is with buffering. And if I pause, and speak more slowly, yeah, the buffers will empty. When the buffers fill up, that's when we end up with these chopping. Okay? Yeah. Okay. And as I said, this is, yeah. Yeah. Cool. And again, I just need to remember to speak more slowly and to pause. Because if I start speaking more quickly right there, the buffer's going to fill up and it's going to start chopping again, right? Did it chop on that? Oh, oh well, <laughs> that was that's that's my theory anyway. <laughs> it's, yes, it did. It actually, didn't. <laughs> well, okay. Yes, it didn't. No, it didn't. Okay, but that's my theory, and maybe it's a good idea for me to speak more slowly and pause anyway. Okay. Yeah. I have no idea what anyone else outside the class is going to think about these videos on YouTube because it looks like I'm talking to no one as far as the video is concerned. Thanks, guys. All right. So, we know that the radius is 1. 
where this one in particular, I'm centering at zero. So I know it converges between negative one and one. I want to check the endpoints where x is equal to one and x equals negative one. So let's do that. So now when x is equal to one, I can see my series is going to look like one plus one plus one. Well, it's all the way through, just one plus one plus one. And I can see immediately that this is going to diverge because the nth term does not go to zero. So it fails the nth term test, also known as the divergence test, and it diverges. The other alternative is let x equals negative one. And you can see what happens. One plus negative one plus one plus negative one plus one. And you see the sign changing? That's the spot where we often use the alternating series test. Okay, and I can say it diverges by the alternating series test because the alternating series test assumes also includes the nth term test as part of the test. So we'll do the alternating series test. The first thing, the part of doing the alternating series test is to use the is to use the divergence test, according to the flow chart that I gave you guys in our last meeting. Okay, so. Here we see that it diverges at both endpoints. So the interval of convergence is just that open interval from negative one to one, okay? Inside that interval, it converges to the function, okay? Outside that interval, the function still exists, but you can't represent it using the power series. You see the difference? And I want to make sure, because that's a subtle difference, but it's really, really, really important for us to know that there, the power series doesn't always apply. Of course, there are other functions, really important functions, and functions we really would like to have as polynomial-ish, the infinite polynomials, that do... They converge everywhere. Sine, cosine, exponential, e to the x. Those all have power series that converge everywhere, which is really, really nice. Ryan, what's going on? Um, I just wanted to ask the formula one over one minus x. That's the um, that's the formula from the geometric series, right? A sub one over one minus r. Yeah, that was the one we did in our last lecture where we're doing fun things like, you know, uh, finding continued finding continued fractions and stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But All you right. get the, the extension just by doing long division. Divide 1 by 1 minus x. And we did that uh, exercise in our last, last class. Um, your mic is really, really quiet. Okay. Your mic is really, really quiet. Um. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, as again, it's probably best um, either come closer to your mic or <laughs> or uh, put it into the chat, okay? So I can make sure I don't miss it. A lot of this time I'm going to be looking down and I'm not going to necessarily see things, okay? But if you put it in the chat, I will eventually see it. That's no real problem. It'll just be a few seconds as I'm looking up and down. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, it was just the, the formula is... Oh, I didn't, I didn't know how to put the formulas in the chat. And I'm not catching any of that. It's too light. Yeah. I could just almost barely hear it, but it was not coming in at all well. Can you guys hear me okay? Am I loud enough? Okay. So I'm, I'm getting a lot of people saying yes, and nobody's saying no, so there we are. Yeah. David Reynolds. Yeah, please go ahead and answer the poll at the bottom of the room, okay? I'm glad to see everybody here today. Okay. And again, guys, remember, I will have these up on YouTube. Um, for you guys, I have to wait. I have to meet with my trig class after you guys. And so it probably won't be for about 2 p.m. Normally, I tell people about an hour. And so that's how that works. Okay. So now, 
we'll just move on and cover a little bit more theory. There we go. Now, power series aren't anywhere near as much fun all on their own, right? So we want to combine them if we can, okay? So let's say that we got two series that converge to functions f and g on some interval i. And that language is very kind of awkward, okay? So I did make sure that you understand these don't always converge to the function. The function can have values outside this interval of convergence for their power series, okay? But if, with that in mind, let's say that f and g both converge in a common interval i, and both of them have power series that converge to those functions on that column. So I'll just identify the function f and g as their power series. And forget about this is only happening inside a particular interval, which could be the all the real numbers, by the way, too. Okay, then what? Then what? Well, then we can do some things to come up with new power series. Okay? There are three big ones. There are three big ones, and let me frame these in. The first one's the obvious one. We had linear combinations. And for the linear combinations, what we're looking at is we're multiplying the first series by j inside and the second series by some constant k. And that's a, just a linear combination and that will converge to j times the first function plus k to the second times the second function, which is kind of boring. But what it basically, what it basically means is, yeah, we can hit these things with constants and add three of these plus five of those ended up with three times the function plus five times the other. Sometimes we want to do a power shift, okay? Instead of starting with x to the zero, we'll want to start with x to the third, okay? And you can do that just multiplying every term by x cubed. And if we do that inside the series, just by multiplying by x and x to the m, we will converge to x to the m times f of x. This will be useful. The next thing we can do is a power lift. Instead of taking powers of x, we can take some powers of x to the m, and that converges to f of x to the m. Okay? So those things are useful in the sense that they work with. There's one more thing that we do with algebra on this. Okay? And that's called products. We talked about linear combinations. We talked about substituting in and shifting. And the other thing we can do is we can look at Cauchy products. Okay? That's pronounced Cauchy. Cauchy. Okay? And I put that in there just to have that same saying for you once, and then I'll take it off because it looks kind of weird. Yeah. It's Euler, not Euler. It's Cauchy, not Cauchy. Okay? So if we've got two functions, f and g, what does it mean to multiply them together on their power series? Well, if I multiply their power series, I'll get another power series, right? Like you multiply two polynomials, you get a polynomial. And that new power series will have its own coefficients. The coefficients of the first function determine the power series, and the coefficients on the second determine the power series. And when you multiply together, we get a new power series with new coefficients. And it converges to the product on i. So there we go. You can take linear combinations. You can shift the power. You can lift the power. And you can multiply two power series together. And that's the standard ways of coming up with new power series. Now let's start off with our favorite example, 1 plus x plus x squared. This is the power series for 1 over 1 minus x inside of its interval of convergence. Let's multiply it by itself and see what happens. Okay, now to make this really easy for myself, I'm just going to look at the coefficients from the sequence 
that get that underlies this series. Okay, so I'm gonna get one plus one x plus one x squared. That's the sequence one one one, which lifts up to the power series. Okay, now my ask my question right there is how what happens when I multiply these two together? Well, the constant term is going to come from multiplying the two constants together. 1 and 1 is 1. Okay? How do I get x out of this? How can I get x to the first power out of this? And the answer is, I'll have to multiply 1 times x here. That will give me an x term. Or I can multiply x times 1 here. That will also give me an x term. And what that means when I'm looking at the coefficients is the zeroth coefficient is just the product of two constants. And the first coefficient is this cross, 1, 1, plus this cross, 1, 1, or 1 plus 1, for the first coefficient, c sub 1. Okay, this is c sub 0, this is e sub 0, this is e sub 1 for the product. And it's this cross plus this cross. 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1. Now, how can I get x cubed? I mean, x squared. Yeah, sorry. I can take 1 times x squared. That gives me an x squared term. I can take x times x. That gives me an x squared term. I can take x squared times 1. And that also gives me an x squared term. So what do you see happening? We have 1 times 1, 1 times 1, 1 times 1 all added. So you see what's happening here? Yes, this is my Cauchy product. And you can see each time I'm going to get, this one is very simple. I get 1, 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1. And the next one is going to have 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, right? And immediately you can see the sequence itself underlying the product, the Cauchy product of my original sequence series is going to have coefficients 1, 2, 3, whatever, right? And if I take that back now to a power series, it looks like 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared plus whatever. And I want to point out this is the power series for 1 over 1 minus x squared. Okay? So we had 1 over 1 minus x over on the top, right? Both of those were for 1 minus 1 over 1 minus x. And if I multiply 1 over 1 minus x, the series, by the series for itself again, I'll get the series for 1 over 1 minus x squared, which is pretty cool. So you got a series that just kind of, you know, multiplies these through together okay and notice right here this series has c sub 0 equal 1 e sub 0 is 1 e sub 1 is 2 e sub 2 is 3 I could easily shift that over so that uh, if I just multiply this by x notice that if I multiply this by x I'll get x plus 2x squared plus 3x cubed plus whatever. In that case, c sub e sub 0 would be 0, e sub 1 would be 1, e sub 2 would be 2. So I'd use a combination of the Cauchy product here and a power shift to represent the what's known as a generating function. 0, which gives me uh, just a counting. 0, 1, 2, 3, based upon the exponents. Okay. So in general, I showed you an example because I didn't want to bang you with this formula first. And here's the formula for what we just did. You're finding the coefficients of the Cauchy product, power series, e sub n, by just finding all the combinations of the two coefficients that add up to n. Right? So, come back over here. This was C0, D1. 0 plus 1 is 1. 
so it showed up here. This is C1, D0. 1 times 1 is 1, so it shows up here. Anytime the coefficients here, C0, C2, adds to 2, it'll show up as inside here. Remember, you start with 0, then 1, then 2. Okay? So, back again, we can look for all the places where the two coefficients, the two indices, add up to the new index. This is one alternate, and I kind of like this, but it's not used a lot. Instead, this one, which is an alternative, which is much more difficult to see, this makes more sense, and this is easier to compute. It's easier to plug in. Okay? And I have a glass of water. There we go. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and expand this so you can see it a little bit. Yeah. At k equals 0, you're looking at c0, n minus 0. If n is 0, I'm looking at c0, d0. For 1, I start at 0, I get C0, D1, plus C1, D0, where the indices add to 1. For E2, C0, D2, plus C1, D1, plus C2, D0. Okay, and you can see that going on and on forever. But I showed you, using those crosses for each term, how you can calculate these. Okay, now, before I go to more general examples, I want to get us ramped up for a regular power series for the actual form of the Taylor series. And so... I'm going to show you today, and we'll look more at these come from the derivative form for the Taylor series on Thursday. But I want you to see how this works, okay? Let's take a look at this polynomial, okay? And I've got, like, some really good news for you guys. It's really easy to find the Taylor series or the Maclaurin series for a polynomial. It's really easy. Guess what, guys? For a, If you have a polynomial function, that polynomial function is its own Taylor series. It is, if I center it zero, it is its own Maclaurin series, I should say. I can do things to using the calculus here to actually do a shift on this and recover the polynomial after I've done the shift. But now, what I'm going to do for this example is I'm going to start off by turning it around, because polynomials, you generally like to count down. Powers 3, 2, 1, 0. For power series, we want to count up 0, 1, 2, 3. So let's start off by just putting it in that form, okay? Lock my screen. And so let's turn it around so it looks right. Negative 4 plus 3x minus 5x squared plus 7x cubed. And now it's in the correct direction for looking at it as power series. To make sure that we understand what we're looking at here, okay, somebody tell me what c sub 0 is on this. What's c sub 0? In the chat, please. What's c sub 0? Anybody? Thank you, Ryan. How about the rest of you guys? Do you see it? Thank you, Kayleen. Two down, nine to go. Okay, thank you, Deborah. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 
thanks, guys. That's awesome. Okay, that's enough of that. Okay, what is C sub 2? What is C sub 2 here? Yep, okay, so you guys are looking at this thing and seeing it. That's great. Thanks, guys. Yeah, C sub 2 is negative 5, right? And C sub 3 is 7, and C sub 1 is 3. For the particular coefficient, you just look at the power and kind of come in here with it. If I look at this as a sequence, I see negative 4, 3, negative 5, 7. Okay? So, the first coefficient, the C0 coefficient, is really easy to find. Notice that F of 0 is negative 4, and that's equal to the first coefficient. Yeah? Pretty cool, huh? Really easy. Okay. But now we're going to do something really interesting. Let's take a derivative. Let's take the derivative of f, okay? What's the derivative of f prime? What is derivative f prime? Okay? Well, the negative 4 goes away, right? And so the derivative looks like what? 3 minus 10x plus 21x squared, doesn't it? Yeah? Okay, guys. Now we're going to do something a little bit more fun. Same thing spot. I'm going to ask what f prime of 0 is. What's f prime of 0? f prime of 0, guys? Let's make sure that you're all with me still. That's right. It's 3. And I want you to notice this is c1. Okay? Let's just continue the same vein. Okay. Now we're going to take f double prime. Let's take the derivative of f prime of x to get f double prime. So f double prime is going to start with what? Negative 10? Okay. Is negative 10 plus 42 x. Yeah? What's f double prime of 0? This is pretty easy. Yeah, negative 10. Now, guys, quick quiz. Is that equal to c2? Is that c2? What's c2? negative 5. So it's off by something, isn't it? It's this right here is twice C2. Yeah? Y'all see that, right? Okay, let's continue on. Okay. Let's take the third derivative, and this time I'm going to do this notation. For the third derivative okay and I could have been doing that all along I'm gonna need that notation for bigger derivatives as we go along okay for example I could have called this f first derivative of x and this f second derivative of x by putting the number of the index in a parentheses people then Oh, I'm sorry, I should have written this more cleanly. Yeah. By putting the derivative as an index, the index of the derivative, I put it in the wrong spot, didn't I? No, I, that's okay, that's what you wanted. If I put that index into a parenthesis, that means the second derivative. And people recognize this is not squaring. This is taking derivatives. Okay? And so I could talk about F3. Of 0 here. Once I'm done with that, right? Yes, I know you're kind of used to seeing as F3. 
punch triple prime. But we're going to get to the point where it's just too many primes to handle. Okay. So again, what's F? What is um, F3 of X here? What's the third derivative, guys? Somebody? You should be able to tell me. Yeah, pretty easy, huh? We love taking derivatives of polynomials, don't we? And on my bad, I'm supposed to write that as a zero, aren't I? Yeah. There we go, f prime of zero. And what is, yeah, it's kind of boring, but yeah. You wanted to make a hitchhiker's reference. That's okay. Do it, do it, do it. I'm a big fan. <laughs> Yes, there you go. So there you go, guys. Power series, power series are the answer to life, the universe, and everything. <laughs> and my class forever on is gonna think F three of zero is the answer is the answer. <laughs> okay. Now, so yeah, so F3 of zero is really easy. Now, guys, what is C3? What is C3? Somebody tell me what C3 is. It's 6C3. Everybody sees that. It's 6 times C3. Okay, guys. Now, I will go ahead and cut to the chase on this, guys. This is C0 times 0 factorial. 0 factorial is determined, is def defined as 1. This is C1 times 1 factorial, where 1 factorial is just 1 all by itself. You're multiplying everything down to 1. There it is. And next thing we see, we get C2 times 2 factorial. Yeah? And this is C3 times 3 factorial. And you can actually see what happened here, right? Because each time, each time we're multiplying by the previous power. So the time we take the first, the first derivative, the one came down. When I'm getting the second polynomial, I've had, when I get to the negative 10, this is because the one came down and the two came down to multiply things together. And you see end up with two factorial. And by the time you get to the third one, you get three coming down and the two coming down before that and the one coming down before that. Yeah, and that's where these factorials are coming from. In general on these, what you're going to find is the nth, the nth coefficient is going to be equal to the nth derivative Okay, the nth derivative at zero divided by the n factorial. And that is from Maclaurin series. That's from Maclaurin series. Okay, and we can expand that, and notice that all of this would have worked the same way if I'd centered it A. And this would be for the Taylor series, where we've shifted by A. Okay. 
we're going to talk about that more in our next meeting, okay? Now, I think this point, we should be ready to do some fun examples, huh? Okay. Let me grab one. Okay, so here we go. Let's do some examples. And I want to do a fun example, okay? And because you guys need something that actually works with this. This example is I want to find the power series for log of x. Measured at x equals 1. Okay. Make sure that's showing up okay. So there's our example. I want to find the power series for log of x equals 1. Okay. So here's what I'm talking about. I'm looking at f of x equals log x equals C0, always, plus C1 x, but I'm shifting it, shifting it by 1. Okay? And now, C2 shifted by 1 squared plus C3 cubed. So there's the series, and it goes on forever, right? Okay. So, gee, I don't know. Now here's the thing, guys. If you can get expression for power series, that's the power series. Okay? I can do all kinds of other things. I can take the derivatives with them at A and then divide it by the factorial the way we just did. And that's what we're going to do on Thursday. We're going to do a lot of it on Thursday. But I want to point out on this one, notice now that prime of x is 1 over x. Yes? Okay. Now, <clears throat> yeah, obviously you're not going to plug in 0 on that, are you? But, we can get key. This is 1 over 1 minus 1 is x. Ooh. And that looked familiar. That's our canonical example. Right? That's our canonical example, isn't it? This looks like 1 over 1 minus R, if you will. Yeah? And I know you're seeing like, I want x minus 1, I'm seeing 1 minus, we'll fix that. We'll fix that. 
Okay. So now let's expand this sum. This is one plus one minus x plus one minus x squared plus minus x cubed plus dot 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 yeah okay now let's turn this around so we're seeing this now in terms of x minus one expansion in terms of x minus one one plus negative one times x minus one plus well squaring it one minus x is the same thing as x minus one i mean one minus x and x minus are just negatives of each other right and so that's what i'm seeing each time right it's negative one x minus one squared right it's going to keep on going right plus negative one x minus one cubed it's working and now we can write it a little bit more elegantly as one plus negative one times x one plus negative one squared times minus one squared plus negative one cubed x minus one cubed and that will continue forever now we've done enough of that one minus r i want to point out that this is for the derivative f prime of x okay my audio is bad again. It comes in. It comes out. You said that it no one that was about a minute ago. I don't know. Somewhere, somewhere within the last minute. Okay. Is it correcting now, Ryan? Is it correcting now? Because the feeling is it's a chop and then chop chopping. Is it still chopping? Still chopping? Yes. Okay. All right. Most of what I can do is just speak that much more slowly. I get the feeling you can mostly hear what I'm saying. Nope, it's still choppy. Well, there we are. I hope it should be clear what we need to do at this point. Yeah, I think it's clear what we need to do here to find f of x. And thank you. I didn't do a thing. The servers, I mean, the network congestion is going to come up and down at Blackboard until they have enough new equipment in. Because that's how you handle increased bandwidth, right? You just add in more servers. And as they add in more servers over the next month or so, it will get a whole lot better. Okay? And hopefully, by the time our classes resume for summer in June, Y'all know all the summer classes have been pushed back three weeks to June, right? Yep, that's just everywhere. And how would you know that, Lourdes? <laughs> I can see Lourdes is going to elf, elf work warrior or something. You know? The summer classes will start on June 1st. Yeah, the <laughs> Kaylee, that was awesome. <laughs> you stay informed. Yeah, ah, uh, right. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. You have brothers. I got it. Okay. Got that. <laughs> You're an orc warrior, 57th level or something, like that. I just know it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome well there you go there you go yeah well any case so here we are we have f prime in this case i mean the derivative of log right so now all i'm going to do is going to take the integral right <laughs> and so when i take the integral i get f of x right and yeah, let's take this. Um, this would be x, right? Ah, uh, plus negative one x minus one squared over two. Yeah. Excuse me. And let me try to get this a little bit better. We started at nine ten. It's 10, 10. We're doing really well here. Okay. Plus negative one squared over three X minus one cubed plus dot, 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 right? You see what is happening? <coughs> but the thing is, I'm still missing something, right? Yeah. There's a constant integration, right? Water, I need water. Yes, I do have a dorm fridge right, fridge right next to me where I keep a gallon of water. Okay. Elf tanks. God, I'm going to have to Google that. Anyway, this is constant of integration. How do we find the constant of integration, guys? Hmm. We could plug in zero, couldn't we? We could plug in zero, right? We could find that constant of integration by plugging in zero, couldn't we? Duh. Somebody tell me what's wrong with that. What number should I plug in? to find the cost of integration. That's right, Ryan. I want everything to go away. Okay, I want all those other terms to zero out, right? The X isn't gonna zero out. The X isn't gonna zero out. But if I plug in one, this term will zero out, this term will zero out, and all the other bigger powers will zero out, right? And so I can check here that f of one is going to be one plus c, yeah? The constant of integration. But f of one is just log of one. What's log of one? What's the log of one, guys? Everybody should know what the log of one is. Yeah. Yeah. Lourdes, Lourdes has gone elf warrior on me here. Back to humans. Back to humans. Timothy's human. <laughs> yeah. Everybody should know that the log, any log, whatever base of one is zero. Yeah. And yes, this translates to the fact that e to the zero equals one. All right? If log of one is zero, then e to the zero. If this is log base e, yeah, okay. There we go. So log of one is zero is one plus c. So C has to be equal to negative one. And now we have F of X. 
I'm actually ready to write down the answer, huh? f of x is x minus 1 because c is negative 1, right? And I already had an x, yeah? And this is like x plus c right here, yeah? This is x plus c. That's x minus 1. Plus negative 1 over 2 x minus 1 squared plus negative 1 squared over 3. And I'm going to get rid of some of that a little bit. Let's just call this negative a half plus a third x minus 1 cubed minus a fourth x minus 1 to the fourth plus dot, dot, dot. And there you go. You struggle with logs. Yeah? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we'll, you, we'll pick up what you need on just the ones we start with, okay? Yeah. Remember, log just means what power, okay? And anytime you, you find yourself, any of you guys, anytime you have an issue with a log function, remember that log translates to what power? of the base. And when I say log, natural log, what power of E is 1? You can always do that. That will turn it around to a question you can answer. Okay? So let's check out our, our C's, okay? You notice, guys, here? We'll notice that C0 zero was 0. Right? C1 was 1. C2 is negative a half. C3 was one third. And in general, we had C sub n, right? Was negative one. Not to the n, but to the n plus 1 or minus 1. Okay? You see that C2... Oh, I'm wrong. Okay? Ask yourself, which ones are positive and which ones are negative? The ones that are positive are the evens, are the odds, and even and negatives are the odd, and yeah. I should have continued, right? C4 was negative a fourth. Yeah? Okay. So I'm seeing that C sub n, negative 1 to the n, gives me positives on evens and negatives on odds. So I need to push it over by 1. And now I'll have positives on odds and negatives over on evens and it's just going to be over n isn't it yeah so that means i can write summation notation i can't do that for i can't use that c sub n right for n equals zero right so I have to have your n greater than 0, not greater than or equal to. Because normally I write n greater than or equal to 0. Negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n That was ugly. Let me fix that. There you go. X minus 1 to the n. And that's a really standard example of why we need Taylor series in addition to just the regular, nat regular natural log series. In, in addition to the regular McLaurin series, I'm sorry. There you 
There we go. So that was pretty cool, huh? That was pretty easy, too. And now, let me grab some more examples. Okay. That one was, was really tight. Okay. Okay, I need to see what's going on here. Okay, something's going on with my notes. I need to see what happened. Two, yes. Yes, that was right. That was my example of Koshi's. And here is a gen general example of a tailor. Okay, I see what happened. Sloppy. I think I fixed this now. Koshi's, then coefficients from derivatives, and then the power series we just did. And now I'm ready to do another example. Okay, guys. This time I'm going to find a power series for this. Okay, so I want to find a power series for this function. Now, guys, this should look familiar. This should look familiar. That's a rational function, isn't it? Yeah? Yeah. That's a rational function. I'm betting we can find an interesting way of writing this. Because huh? I want to remind you guys that as soon as we get 1 over 1 minus something, we can do things with that. And so, and any of these, like 1 over x minus 3, you can write that as negative 1 over 3 minus x, yeah? And you can write that as negative 1 third over 1 minus x over 3. And that is negative 1 third times 1 plus x over 3 plus x over 3 squared plus dot dot dot. That's the idea that we're going to be using here. But before we can do that, we need to bust this up into its partial fractions. And that's the trick we're going to use here. Ah, uh, yeah, we're going to decompose it into, into its partial fractions. So, guys... Now, we could do the long way or hard way, right? But I suggest that we use Professor de Moyer's insta coefficients and look at these at their roots, at, neg at 3 and negative 1, okay? And if we look at these at the roots, the numerator is the top, and the denominator is going to be the bottom, excluding or excluding any zeros, okay? At 3, this gives me a 0, right? So ignore that. And at 3, this gives me 4, doesn't it? So there's my first insta coefficient. At negative 1, 
this, and again, I'm going to get 4, the top divided by, now let's look at the bottom, at negative 1, this will give me negative 4, at negative 1, this will give me 0, and you discard the zeros. Yes, you're going to see negative 4, so everybody's ahead of me on this, right? That's cool. So, let's look at this. This is equal 1 over x minus 3 minus 1 over x plus 1. Okay, and we're going to handle these separately and then add the results. This, as I said, is negative 1 third over 1 minus x over 3. Okay, this is negative 1 over 1 plus x. Okay, so here's what I'm seeing. Negative one third times one plus x over three plus x squared over nine I need some more real estate. There we go plus x cubed over 27, dot, dot, dot. And this is going to be negative 1 times 1 minus x. You see what I did there, guys? Because that was a cute little trick. I'm using 1 minus negative x instead of 1 plus x. If it was 1 minus x, you get 1 plus x plus x squared minus x plus x squared. For 1 plus x, it just changes sides. Minus x cubed plus dot dot dot. Okay? And so, sometimes it's nice to go ahead and take a look at just the coefficients. Negative 1 third comma negative one ninth, negative one twenty seventh, negative one eighty first, and that's what happens just because I took the negative one third and I brought it in. Okay? And this is going to be plus negative one one negative one one dot 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 okay now I can add these and I'm gonna what negative a third minus one is negative four thirds right right 1 minus a ninth is 8 ninths. Negative 1 minus a 27th. That should be negative 28 27ths, yeah? Okay. 1 minus 1 over 81. Looks like 80 over 81. Okay. And I can continue these calculations forever. Right? But I can pull just the first four on this. Okay. And that would give me the Taylor series, the third Taylor series. Okay, and I want to make sure that we're clear on this. T0 of x is negative 4 thirds. Okay, 
That's the zeroth order Taylor series. T1 of x is negative 4 thirds plus 8 ninths x. And here you're looking at the partial series up to the zeroth power, up to the first power, up to the second power. And this is called the zeroth order, first order, second order, third order Taylor series, zeroth order, first order, second order, third order approximations. And that's a standard way of doing these things. T sub 2 of x negative four thirds plus eight ninths cleaner eight ninths x minus 28 20 sevenths x squared third order taylor series third order approximation Okay, third order approximation. Minus 28 20 sevenths x squared plus 80 over 81 x cubed. Okay, in general, the Taylor series is going to be the whole series. We'll call it T of x, T of x. And we're going to look at approximations here after a while. You notice that T0x is missing all the terms beyond T0, right? And T2 of x is missing all the terms beyond T sub 2. The rest of the terms we're excluding are going to be called the remainder. Okay? And we'll end up taking a look at the Taylor series T of x as the sum of its nth order approximation plus its nth order remainder, where the nth order remainder is going to be the sum of the missing terms. Then we're going to look at that nth order remainder and come up with a bound on it. And that is going to be our estimation of error. That's for Thursday. Okay, to give you an idea of where we're going with this. Now, I wanted to make sure that we've, I wanted to make sure that we understand where we have been on this, right? So we spent the time before our break, right? Um, after we finished our little uh, segue into differential equations, that one day thing on differential equations, just a quick introduction for the separables. Um, then we looked at sequences and series. And the whole point of looking at the sequences and series was so that we could look at these Taylor series and know when they converged. Okay, that's where this is. And so this right here, the last, this chapter and the previous chapter were all about being able to find Taylor series and use those for approximating functions. Use those in place of functions when that's appropriate. Okay? Yeah. Um, I want to mention as well okay, that I promised is it, are we there yet? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to give you the Taylor series, right? for the exponentials, the e to the x, on our next lecture. And then I'm going to plug in ix instead of x. And what's going to come out is the Euler identity. OK? So anybody who is with me in trig or pre-calc, Thursday is the day I keep the promise that I would teach, that I would prove the Euler identity for you in Calc 2. <laughs>
And that happens. That happens. Yeah. I will get students that follow me all the way through or follow me with a break, taking somebody else for Calc 1. And that's how that works. Okay. So more examples time. Pick out my next example. I'm going to get a product in here. I'm trying to find an example that I like with the Koshi products. I did a bunch of these. I actually wrote down too many examples. You know, this is an important example, so I'm going to do this one now. Okay. Now, you all know what factorial means, right? It's the product of all the numbers here down to zero, down to one, I'm sorry. So three factorial is the product of three times two times one. And five factorial is the product five times four times three times two times zero, one. We make a special. Exception for zero, because that's an empty product. Uh, one factorial is just the singleton product, just one. Z zero factorial is called the empty product because there aren't any numbers from zero counting down to one, and we call it an empty product. And for the empty product is what you get when everything is canceled, and that gives you one factorial. Okay? So on this polynomial, f of x, I want to prove that this function is equal to its own derivative. It's 1030. Oh, okay. Well, next time. Thanks, guys. I had my head set right there. I thought we were going to, uh, I, I, I was confused because I got the one class that goes for two hours. And I was thinking we're going to 10. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Osmaldo. We're good. I've covered everything I wanted to cover today. I thought I had some extra time, but I don't. And that's good enough. At this point, I am going to stop our recording.